Hello, everyone. Welcome to session 16 of LTech 676. Quiet. Believe it or not, we've made it to the final session of the semester. Congratulations. To get things started in our final video together, I want to take a minute to remind you that the final paper is due on Monday, May 8th at 11.55 a.m. In addition, you'll see two other tasks listed in Canvas. The first task is to complete the anonymous end of semester course evaluation. You've seen these before and you know they only take a few minutes to complete. I want to encourage all of you to participate and to share your feedback. Your insight is really valuable for improving this class over time and for supporting me individually as a member of UH's instructional faculty. So thanks in advance for taking the time to get that done. The second task listed here is to retake the professional views on technology questionnaire. This is the same questionnaire we took way back in session one. The goal, of course, is to compare how your individual views about technology may have shifted as a result of the topics we've learned about this semester. That should be pretty interesting. Next up, I want to share with everyone what was covered in last week's optional synchronous session. In total, seven of us were able to get together, and we kicked off the discussion by focusing on a recent report published by Pew Research. This report was titled Public Awareness of Artificial Intelligence in Everyday Activities, and it was subtitled Limited Enthusiasm in U.S. Over AI's Growing Influence in Daily Life. Now, based on this article, we took a fun little quiz and then examined some of the findings from the report, such as the result that U.S. adults with higher levels of education and income demonstrate greater awareness of AI in daily life. Of course, in our conversation, we emphasized how that finding and many others seem to align with other topics we've been studying this semester. Anyway, if you're interested in watching the session, I've posted a screen recording of our conversation in Canvas, so be sure to check that out. Okay, let's move on. Our video today is divided into two sections. First, I want to make sure we close out our last theme related to gender and digital equity. From there, in the second part of the video, we'll zoom out to talk about the whole of education and technology. And most importantly, we'll try to end on what Miller calls perspectives of hope in the digital age. So let's get started. Last week, we took a look at women in higher education, and we also talked about trends in women and participation in computer science. This week, I want to delve a bit deeper into the relationship between gender and technology. And to do that, I want to talk a little bit about narratives of modernity. And this is based on some work by Francesca Bray, who argues that one fundamental way in which gender is expressed in any society is through technology. Technical skills and domains of expertise are divided between and within the sexes, shaping masculinities and femininities. And Bray argues in her 2007 article, Gender and Technology, that since technology and gender are both socially constructed and socially pervasive, we can never fully understand one without also understanding the other. So with that in mind, I want to talk a little bit about the standard view of modernity. And that view goes something like this. Science is the purest and most powerful form of knowledge. It's the driving force of modernity. Technology is the application of science to practical problems. Technology plays a critical role in shaping the production of scientific knowledge. Studies of technology in the past were largely gender blind and they focused on modern industrial and military technologies and reflected the social realities of the male-dominated engineering and business worlds. So that's kind of the standard view of modernity as summarized by Francesca Bray. 
Now, let's talk a little bit about feminist critiques of that standard view of modernity. So, first, feminist critiques condemned technology as intrinsically oppressive of women. Such critiques noted that the standard view perpetuated stereotypes of women as inherently nurturing. These critiques also asked why and how modern Western technology had become a male domain. These critiques were also concerned about divisions of labor and the assignation of women to the domestic sphere. Feminist critiques expanded the spectrum of significant technologies. Feminist critiques interrogated concepts such as technological efficiency. Do technologies really make things more efficient? And feminist critiques unmasked the politics embedded in the design of technological artifacts. Now, an important question has to do with how do technological artifacts come to be as they are? Well, Bray argues that we need to think about the technology pipeline. And on the left-hand side, we can think about the beginning of the pipeline where technologies are created. And on the right-hand side, we can think about where technologies are actually available in the marketplace and actually are consumed by consumers slash users. According to Bray, we can study this technological pipeline by focusing on either end of this technology pipeline. So, for example, an upstream analysis focuses on producers, the people who are conceptualizing products and services, the people who are marshalling the resources necessary to conceptualize and ultimately create those products and services as well as the people who decide on the design, the production, and the marketing of various technologies. All of that is what Bray calls an upstream analysis. Now, in contrast, we can also have a downstream analysis. Now, downstream analyses focus on consumers, and this involves viewing consumers as users or even refusers of certain technologies. Downstream analyses view consumers as engaging with the physical as well as the symbolic dimensions of technology, and it recognizes that consumers can produce meaning and reproduce power relations based on their choices. An important concept to emerge out of gender and technology studies related to the technology pipeline is this idea of the consumption junction. And this is the place and the time at which the consumer makes choices between competing technologies. Am I going to purchase brand X or brand Y? Or am I not going to purchase any of these particular technologies? And then another important concept to come out of gender and technology studies is this idea of interpretive flexibility. The idea that there can be divergent interpretations of form, use, or meaning of a particular technological objects or of its uses and users. Now I want to shift gears a little bit to talk about claiming technology for democracy and social justice. So let's zoom out and away from our five themes and just focus on education and technology. Now, Miller gives us a message of hope, and she argues that new digital technologies can change the balance of power and extend voice to silent populations. Just as quickly as technology can extend democratic opportunities, however, it can also silence groups and contribute to marginalization or oppression. She believes that with the ever-increasing use of digital technologies in schools, it is increasingly important to develop a deliberate frame for technology integration based on empowerment and democratic principles. Framing technology as a means for empowerment and democracy is counter to the traditional uses of technology in schools. So what are the traditional uses of technology in schools? Well, Miller includes a quote from Blickstein, who argues that the traditional use of technology in schools contains its own hidden curriculum. It surreptitiously fosters students who are consumers of software and not constructors. 
Students adapt to the machine and do not reinvent it. They accept the computer as a black box, which only specialists can understand, program, or repair. For the most part, these passive uses of technologies include unidirectional access to information, communication with other people, and propagation of info to others. That's the traditional framing of technology in schools. Now, Miller warns us about technical rationality, and this is the view that a technique proven to be effective in one application will also be effective in a similar application. It's problem solving from an instrumental approach that relies on scientific techniques. Such a paradigm emphasizes efficiency, automation, reliability, consistency, and predictability, all of which contribute to a reliance on external control. Technology is designed to do its job accurately and efficiently while performing the task the same without failure. The faster and more precisely technology does its job, the more successful it is at performing its design task. So what's wrong with that, you might be asking yourself. Well, the problem occurs when automation creeps into daily life and leads to the automation of thought processes, human interactions, and behavior. The technical nature of technology contributes to the assumption that technological tools are neutral and free from political constructs. And much of technology is designed for reasons related to capitalism, such as selling merchandise, advertising, or collecting data and information about target audiences. This reality is exacerbated by the hierarchical structures in schools. Technology is being used to replace teachers, automate rationale, and silence already struggling populations. Instead of providing opportunities for change, the use of the computerized curriculum contributes to the perpetuation of the cycle of disenfranchisement. So you can see here in this pyramid, students, families, and communities are at the bottom, and all the way at the top, above teachers and administrators, is the positioning of technology. And Miller warns that when technology is introduced and given the ability to make decisions about student progress and curriculum, it may have the potential to hold an even higher position of power than the administration. And this happens when tools such as computer-based instruction, learning, learning management systems, and testing instruments are over-relied upon to make decisions about students and their learning. This puts educators in what Miller calls a double bind. On the one hand, by rejecting technological advances, our teaching and our students would be removed from the interaction and opportunities that are possible in a digital environment. However, on the other hand, fully embracing this digital world involves knowingly entering into an an environment that is rooted in a technical paradigm that is not designed for emancipation or social justice. Thus, a critical question emerges. How can educators implement technology in ways that promote student empowerment, voice, construction of knowledge, well-being of the community, and critical interrogation of the status quo? To answer that large question about whether education should embrace or reject technological advances, Miller provides us with critical questions educators should be asking themselves. And these critical questions fall into three distinct areas. The first area has to do with dialogue and voice. And the purpose of these questions is to investigate the role that technology plays in the dialogic interactions among participants. Some guiding questions include, how does this technological tool influence student voice? How can this tool be used to support the construction and development of students' own ideas and knowledge? The second category of critical questions has to do with classroom community. The purpose of these guiding questions is to interrogate the position and power that technological tools play in the larger classroom community. Sample guiding questions include, what is the role of technology in the classroom community? And what power does the technology have in the community structure? 
The third category of critical questions for educators has to do with emancipatory knowledge. The purpose of these critical questions is to investigate the type of knowledge that's created and the role that technology plays in the creation of that knowledge. And guiding questions include what types of knowledge are being implemented or created and what level of criticality is employed when those technologies are used and how is the technology being used to further critical knowledge. And there you have three categories of critical questions for educators if we are to decide whether or not to embrace or reject specific technological advances. Okay, everyone, we're out of time for today. Have a great week, and I'll see you in Canvas.